Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. W.F. Strong. Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. W.F. Strong, and excited about our book today, Seinfeldia, How a Show About Nothing Changed Everything, by Jennifer Keishan Armstrong. She's... uh, She's here, and we're going to talk to her in just a moment. But before that, I want to thank our underwriter, audiobooks.com, where your first book is free. Just go to audiobooks.com, you sign up, and you pay $14 a month, and every month you get a new premium book to listen to. So it's a wonderful, wonderful um, medium for our modern publishing world. One of the things I like about it is that if you're listening to your book in the car, and then you go into the house and turn on your iPhone to listen there, then it will pick up right where you left off. It bookmarks things for you, so that's pretty cool. All right, we're going to talk about Seinfeldia. This is a wonderful book, what I call a biography of the Seinfeld series. I loved it. I recommend it. And we're fortunate to have the author, Jennifer Armstrong, here to fill us in on uh, the brilliance of Seinfeld. Uh, Welcome, Ms. Armstrong. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Oh, I tell you, I really, really love the book. I I read it uh, in about uh, two sittings over two days, and it really was, to me, like reading a biography uh, of a show because you went from the early days, its birth, (laughs) to its, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just followed its chronology like a person, and that that was just wonderful. Did you do that on purpose? Yeah, I think so. That is that is sort of the idea. I, I, the other way, the other fancy way I refer to the kinds of books I write are cultural histories. So mm-hmm. the cultural history of the show. You know, I, I like to go beyond just behind the scenes, even though that is obviously part of it. I didn't mm-hmm. just want it to be a bunch of trivia, you know. Well, you worked for, uh, for a long time at ET, right? Entertainment Weekly. Entertainment so Weekly. Yeah, uh, yeah. But you have, but that's the same procedure, right? Where you're going, mm-hmm. you're digging deep, kind of, to get the behind the scenes information for people. Yeah, exactly. I covered a lot of television when I was on staff at Entertainment Weekly, so you know, it, it definitely comes from that training. And your background before that is, uh, do you have a journalism background? Yes, I've mm-hmm. always been a journalist since I was an adult, and even a little bit before that. (laughs) Um, I was a journalism major at Northwestern University, and then a a newspaper reporter. Yeah, it was a good good journalism school. I was a newspaper, a local newspaper reporter for a while, which is wonderful training, even though it is awful when you're doing it. And um, then from, you know, eventually from there, a few weird steps in between, um, I ended up on staff at Entertainment Weekly, where I was for about 10 years until I quit to write books a few years ago. Well, and what other books have you written? So my last book was a similar book about the Mary Tyler Moore show. Uh, mm-hmm. That's called Mary and Lou and Rhoda and Ted and talks a lot about um, behind the scenes stuff, specifically the largely female writing staff, which was extremely New Unusual. Uh-huh. at that time, yeah, it was it was really special that that these women got to tell their own stories through the character of Mary, which is why we love her so much. Um, <laughs> well, that so show very similar that show had sim- that that show had similar impact uh, uh, to the Seinfeld show, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's harder than it looks mm-hmm. to come up with a TV show that actually stands up to book treatment. Um, mm-hmm. You can like a show, but that doesn't mean you want to read a whole book about it, you know, right. or certainly write a whole book about it. I'm always looking for something that's had, had a lot of impact and also has an interesting enough backstory to really hold up to that long book treatment. What I found interesting in the early part of your book that I didn't realize is that, uh, for one thing, the show itself is almost an autobiography of the show. Mm-hmm. And and uh, but the thing I didn't realize is how uh, I guess I, I guess the uh, network wasn't that interested in it. They just said, "Well, let's give it a shot and see what happens." They they, they weren't big believers in it in the beginning. Yeah, and you know that's it's funny because that actually is very parallel to the Mary Tyler Moore show, and I think is certainly something that makes the the story a little more fun, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, just, we we 
we like to have that suspense and the underdog feeling. Um, this is kind of the ultimate underdog show, really, and it became one of the biggest shows. This they they didn't really get it at mm-hmm. NBC, it, or I don't even know if that's the right way to say it because they liked it. Mm-hmm. You know, or they wouldn't have put it on at all. They kept going like, we think this is funny. We don't think America's going to, but <laughs> hey. <laughs> Let's you give know? it a try. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and that's why it was, so today is actually an anniversary of, the anniversary of the first episode. It's like a weird anniversary. It's like the 27th or something. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, it is the anniversary, which I mentioned simply because I think most of us who know anything about television know that premiering on July 5th, <laughs> it's not like super yeah, great news. That's right. You know? Um, and furthermore, they only ran one episode then. There was mm. one episode on in the summer of 1989. So it's not exactly a ringing endorsement. Um, but they liked it enough. They saw enough people saying, like, eh, that's kind of interesting that they let them do four more the next summer. And then they let them do 12 or 13 the following year. So it was a really slow build. Um, and I think in the end that, that helped a lot because if you watch those early episodes, they're weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they don't have quite the the flair and the polish of the later ones. Exactly. The characters aren't quite there yet. Mm-hmm. I got to tell you, watching the pilot, I mean, it's so strange. I recommend it if you're a big fan. Um, if you haven't done it lately, it's so strange. It's like, Kramer knocks before he comes in. Uh-huh. He has this dog. Oh, he has a pet dog that, who never shows up again. Um, you know, George knows more about women than Jerry does, and he's, like, giving Jerry girl advice. Like, it's, <laughs> it's very strange. <laughs> it's, well, that, that universe tipped over a good deal from the beginning, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I saw Seinfeld on The Tonight Show, his first ever mm. uh, television I guess his national television appearance, mm-hmm. and uh, I loved him right away. You know, and I, I know that, uh, and I remember thinking this guy is is going to go places because I remember very clearly he did uh, the one about the the six hundred pound guy who lost two hundred pounds, yeah. and and what are you going to call him? You're going to say now you're a rail baby. You're only 400 pounds. How do you compliment a guy like that? So that observational comedy, uh, I took to right away. It was, it was kind of like uh, Carlin without the, uh, you know, acerbic nature to it. It was uh, kind-hearted, and I, I liked it. Uh, not to say I didn't like Carlin also. I just saw it as different. And yeah. uh, so when the show came on, I was very interested in it because it starts off with him as a stand-up. And, um, and I, I just liked the whole uh, concept of what he was doing there. Now, how do you... Uh, classify Seinfeld, the series, in with other, um, you know, situ- I don't know if you call it a situation comedy, but I guess it is. Uh, how, do, how do you put it in the, in the pantheon of comedies on television? Yeah, I do think it's a situation comedy. It's funny, we've, we've gotten to a point now, I think, with TV that, you know, there are these shows with, like, girls or something where you go, like, I don't know, what is that? Uh-huh. Um, but, I, and I think Seinfeld helped pave the way for that. You know, I think... It was the first big, it's so clearly still a situation comedy. There are situations that they get comedy from, you know? Yes, yes. But they almost strip it down to its purest form. It's only comedy. Mm -hmm. Like, they, you know, one of the famous things that Larry David said is no hugging, no learning. Mm -hmm. He didn't want that on his show. Mm -hmm. And that's what defined most that comes before that, right, is that everybody learns a lesson in the end after the hijinks. Mm-hmm. This didn't happen on Seinfeld. This is just, hey, these crazy people did a bunch of funny things, and then it was over, you know? <laughs> um, and that's the, that's the innovation they brought to it. One of the biggest um, moments for the show early on is the episode called The Chinese Restaurant. <laughs> I where love that, yeah. <laughs> and I do too. I have, it's one of my favorites for sure. And the reason that's brilliant, no one had seen anything like this on television before. It's a half hour show that is only about three people waiting for a table at a Chinese restaurant. They don't get it. And then they leave. Mm-hmm. And so NBC was like, no, no, we've, we've put up with a lot with you guys, but this is not a, this is, this is not a sitcom episode. Uh-huh. 
this is like a sitcom episode without anything happening. And they were like, right, that's the point. That's the point. <laughs> um, so that's, that's where things really start to change, and they were really playing with the form, um, you know, making making it into a little bit more of an artistic form. And, and it's the reason we can now see, you know, everybody talks about the golden age of television now. Um, I think that they help to start, you know, paving the way in, in the sense that they're taking the traditional form and tweaking it and tweaking it. And you almost, it's almost like America didn't realize that that's, that it was, it happened so slowly, it snuck up on them and they loved it and it worked. I think that episode was absolutely worth it just for the one line, you know, from, from the restaurant owner uh, who at the end, he says, I called your name. I said, Cartwright. Cartwright. <laughs> <laughs> said, it's Costanza. <laughs> it's wonderful. That, that, that one line is worth the whole 30 minutes of waiting. And, and, and they have a lot of good shows of, of waiting. Uh, the one where mm-hmm. uh, Jerry and uh, and George are waiting with um, Elaine's father, who's uh, you know a very frightening uh, dude, <laughs> and, uh. and they just are just dying trying to talk to this guy, and he thinks they're both uh, wimps, and they think that he could kill them any, <laughs> at any moment just for fun. Yes. <laughs> That is definitely one of my favorites, too, and it's pretty early as well. Um, and that's so interesting that you say that about waiting. That, mm-hmm. That's really true, and I, I think it goes back to that everyday thing, you know, that it has where it's, it's dealing with these everyday frustrations. Mm-hmm. And is that not one of our greatest modern frustrations? Oh, yes, waiting. yes. We don't like that. We don't even like to wait for things to load on the computer. You know? Right. And people totally. get frustrated with 60 seconds. <laughs> they change and go somewhere else. Say, this is taking too long. The, exactly. Uh, the thing that you point out that I certainly did not know is the uh, amount of content that comes from the real world. I didn't know that there was a real Kramer. I didn't know mm. that uh, Peterman was a real catalog. And, uh, and and then I found it funny that Peterman, the real J. Peterman, worried uh, a bit about uh, uh, being overwhelmed by popularity because people would, would you know, flock to his uh, catalog. And, and then the show was worried about the legal infringement or something. And then I thought, well, God, when I saw, saw the show, I just thought it was fiction. I never thought it was real. And I never thought to look for J. Peterman at all. Yeah, this is this is very common. Um, and I love that. You, I love hearing that you didn't know that because, you know, I'm like, you, get, you get into these topics and they're like, is, is this something everybody knows or not or what? Um, so I was really, you may have noticed if you read the book, I was really mm-hmm. interested in this sort of fun house mirror aspect mm-hmm. of this show where it's like, there's real versions, there's fake versions, you know, there's real and fictional versions mm-hmm. of a lot of thing, a lot of people. Um, and there's a funny way that they have of like when they're talking about themselves in the world, like, you know, what's real and what isn't. It's like, the real, the guy who played the soup Nazi actually kind of markets himself as quote-unquote the real soup Nazi, which Mm -hmm. is wrong, if you think Mm -hmm. about it, because the real soup Nazi is the guy it was based on, not the guy who played him. Um, Kramer, uh, Kenny Kramer, the basis of Kramer, gives a bus tour, um, (laughs) calls himself the real Kramer, um, calls it like the Seinfeld reality tour. Um, So there's there's this really interesting interplay between reality, quote unquote reality, and fiction on this show um, that started with just the the straight up edict of let's use real life as much as possible because that's the most relatable. But it ends up with having all of these doubles of, you know, the real people and then the the characters on the Mm -hmm. show. Um, Well, that's what I I didn't realize that uh, Kramer was a real guy with the real name of Kramer that lived across the Mm -hmm. hall from Larry David. I didn't realize he had pulled him out of real life and then they bought the rights to his name. Yes. Uh, And then I didn't, I didn't realize that, uh, that a great number of the writers uh, for the show also took real experiences from their lives and made a show of it. Yeah, it was almost a rule. I mean, they wouldn't, you know, they weren't kicked off if they do something else. If they came up with something great, that's fine. But mostly the the instruction was to use something from real life and have the characters do the thing you wish you had done Mm -hmm. in that situation. And I think that's what makes it so satisfying to us to watch is that these are things that have happened to all of us, but these characters, because they're crazy and terrible people, um, <laughs> will do the things that we wish we could, but we can't. You know, we'd never do what George does, yes. but George will, <laughs> and it's fun to watch. 
Well, the other thing that uh, you spent a great deal of time on this, and again, I didn't know that Festivus, the great Mm. Christmas, pre-Christmas festival, was actually uh, uh, in the family of one of the writers, and he told one writer about it. Tell us about that. How'd that come about? Yeah, that is one of my favorite stories of real life in fiction, for Mm -hmm. sure. What's funny is the final version of Festivus on the show is quite different from Mm -hmm. what I quote unquote real Festivus, but this was in the family of a writer named Dan O'Keefe, who is wonderful and witty and hilarious and it it clearly those qualities maybe come a little from from his crazy family his father made up a holiday called festivus and you know there were different aspects to it from the show it's not it's not the day before christmas the way it is on the show Mm -hmm. um it was actually more like it could be at any time they Mm -hmm. would be surprised um and, you know, there were crazy traditions about, like, the way you knew Festivus was coming was there was a clock in a bag on the table. <laughs> like, very strange, strange things. And he, you know, I think part of it is a put-on, but part of it is real, that he really seemed like this was, like, traumatizing to him, the mm-hmm. same way it was to George. Like, he did not want people to know that his father did this super weird thing. Mm-hmm. And the airing of grievances was real. Um, one of one part of it, or it's it's sort of like it, one part of the, the real Festivus holiday is that they would get out a tape recorder and they all talk about, like, their difficulties of the past year and that sort of thing um, and tape record it. So it's sort of like the airing of grievances. The opposite and of Christmas. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it, they were very, they, they seemed to be a very sort of intellectual family, um, you know, and this was, it, it was sort of supposed to be different from Christmas in the sense that it wasn't commercial um, and kind of a secret family holiday. I think it sounds kind of cool. I would love it if my family had a secret holiday that was only theirs. Isn't that, like, this yeah. seems fun. Yeah, why don't you start um, it? You yeah, could do I it. So. I guess so. But actually, it is um, done, right? I mean, Festivus yeah. is actually celebrated by people now. That's what's so funny is so this guy's dad made this up and he was so embarrassed for so long, but he like, you know, he told a friend who happened to also be a writer on the show and then that friend told some other writers and then they were like, listen, we told Jerry and it's in the show. (laughs) Um, And he was terrified at first. But um, so they, you know, like I said, they used parts of of Festivus and then kind of made up parts like the, the metal pole and all of that. Um, And what's funny is that it really is now like people talk about it. People People celebrate it. There are definitely celebrations at bars and on college campuses. I've seen Festivus polls for sale. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a Festivus flavor of Ben and Jerry's. Uh-huh. Um, so this is very strange for this guy, <laughs> you know, for, for Dan O'Keefe, mm-hmm. who had experienced this in his own life. And he, of course, said that, you know, at first his dad was like a little freaked out that this was happening. And then he felt like it was a real validation for all of his crazy ideas once it really started to catch on across America. Um, so well, it's, the, it, it just, it's, a, it's just one more of these reality versus fiction cra- crazy things. Well, let's talk about another thing that caught on is the, uh, the language of Seinfeld. Uh, mm-hmm. There must be at least 10 popular memes, linguistic memes that came out of that show, like yada, 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 and what else? Oh, God, there's so many. It's like double dipping. Um, master my um, domain. Master my no- domain. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> I've used um, that a lot. Yeah, every, but they're so useful. That's mm-hmm. part of, again, going back to the, the coming from real life thing. I really think that's why this all ends up working together, is that these phrases are useful. Yes. They're expressing a thing we didn't know how to express before. Mm-hmm. And that's why we then use them in real thing. Like, not that there's anything wrong with that. That was like really a little bit freeing. I think it's it's expressing a lot. It's expressing sort of like liberal anxiety at the time over like wanting to be accepting of gay culture, but like kind of still feeling weird about it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really interesting. I just you know, and and they're also great phrases a lot of the time. Master of my domain is just a great phrase in addition <laughs> to helping us express something a little more politely than, you know, saying it directly would. Well, that's another part of your book that I think you handle brilliantly because you talk about the episode, the Master of My Domain episode, and uh, what a 
tightrope walk it was to do this story about masturbation without ever mentioning the word. Yeah, that's, I mean, to me, this is maybe, you know, a turning point in the sense that I think it was hitting, it's it's not its peak, but like it was really starting to get popular Mm -hmm. at that time. And then this happens and people just went crazy for it. And yeah, they did a whole episode about masturbation without ever saying the word or any other dirty-ish words at mm-hmm. all. Mm-hmm. Everything's implied by their their phrases that they, you know, I, I love that they keep adding them. It's like, master of my domain, queen of the castle. Like, I, I love queen of the castle. Um, you know, and, and they, they just keep, the characters themselves keep making up these mm-hmm. terms. And then there's also this great um, sort of filmic thing they do where once somebody has, bowed out of the contest, uh-huh. um, they are sleeping soundly, <laughs> yes. and the people who are still trying to eat are tossing and turning, and mm-hmm. that's how you sort of keep score throughout the, the episode, and it's it's really, it's such a clever piece of work, and I, you know, I think that's when people really started to go, oh, I'm into this Seinfeld thing. Well, there's this uh, term in... Uh, Greek logic called enthymematic, the, and you can apply it to humor when something is um, left for you to fill in, for you to figure out mm. without ever explaining it. It's called enthymematic or enthymematic humor. You supply what's missing, and that's that show is, is brilliant in that regard. They pulled that off without having to ever mention the word. Yeah, I think it would have been so much less funny if even once someone had said the word. It would have it would have taken away from it, but that's just perfect perfect thing for the '90s, you know, network television where standards were still pretty strict. And then they had others like that. Uh, Spongeworthy, I think, is kind mm. of in the in the ballpark, so to speak. Uh, I think so for sure. Mm-hmm. That's a big deal, you know. I mean, particularly because it's a fe- it's it's female birth control, and it's like a woman talking about it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's like. They weren't talking about condoms. They weren't. This, this is a very specific thing, and they're also implicitly acknowledging that Elaine has a sex life mm-hmm. and likes sex, not necessarily because she's hoping to find a husband. You know, it's a big deal. Um, she's kind of promiscuous. She's she is. She's like <laughs> she's like the guys. You know, yes. and and that is that was big. That was a big deal, and to be also talking about this like. Like I don't want to say strange form of birth control, but it's like it's like a little you know, it's a very specific thing. It's a very specific form of birth control, and I do love when she's hoarding them. Um, <laughs> and then you pointed out how that became real life too, in a way. Yeah, yeah, that's that's yet another one, and it was from real life, and then it became real life. It was like a weird you know loop, but um, it was inspired by you know an NPR story or something that uh, the writer P- Peter Melman heard that the Today Sponge was going out of production, and he thought, well, what if Elaine uses the Today Sponge? She's not going to like that at all. Um, so that's where that episode came from. And then once it was, of course, once it was on this huge TV show, there was, like, more demand for Today Sponges than ever. So I think that they actually did, like, there was something where they, like, kept making them for a little while, and then they did eventually go out of production again. But... Um, yeah, they, they had a little, a nice little bump, just, just like so many other products. They, they had a nice little bump from, from Seinfeld exposure. Now, we, we were talking before we came on the air, and I was telling you that in, in my personal comedic history, I went from MASH uh, to Cheers, from Cheers to Seinfeld, Seinfeld to Friends, and now I get my humor out of uh, Game of Thrones, kind of dark humor. But uh, is there a... Uh, is that standard, or are there a lot of people who kind of have followed that sort of paradigm as they went through the last 40 years of comedy? I think so. It's such a, I love that. I love, I love your flowchart, because I do think, like, I never thought about it quite that way. It's like, I do think that's pretty much how most of America has gone, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and Friends and, and Seinfeld were sort of concurrent, but, but Seinfeld ended before Friends, and those were always sort of dueling... Um, you know, entities of Mm -hmm. the 90s at that time. And and a lot of people will say, like, you're either a Friends or a Seinfeld person. I'm both as well, Mm -hmm. like you. Um, You know, but but Friends did have feelings. You know, Friends did have hugging and learning a lot. Oh, yes, yes. Whereas Seinfeld, you know, didn't. But Friends is a solid show. 
and now we do get our our humor in strange places. You know, it's like if we have so much good television. I mean, it's embarrassing. And you're right, Game of Thrones is funny a lot of the time. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> Tyrion, he's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes it makes me laugh at things mm. I know I shouldn't. Mm-hmm. And it's it's uncomfortable, but man, that's a good show. <laughs> well, I think also, I, I guess in a if we're going to talk seriously about comedy, I, I suppose that uh, Big Bang Theory is kind of, you know, the modern version of of something like Friends, I suppose. Yeah, I think it is. Um, it's really, I was just talking to my mom. My mom loves the show, so I was just talking to her about it. And mm. it's, it's really classic. You know, mm. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a watcher. Like, I'm not a devoted watcher, but I've seen it. Mm. Um, and it's, it's really, like, well executed sitcom, you mm-hmm. know. Um, we just most most of our shows, like the cool kid shows now, um, kind of veer away from that traditional uh, formula, and mm-hmm. that's you know that's why that show doesn't get the sort of like cool kid cachet. It probably would have been cool, you know, twenty years ago or something. Mm-hmm. It's just that now we we're like girls and Orange is the New Black, and that that can be very funny too. Orange is the New Black, there's some extremely funny funny lines in there. Yeah. But but macabre. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. It's like, you know, it's hard to compare something like Orange is the New Black and and Big Bang Theory. Yes. But I I like your point that we get our humor from strange places. And then Mm -hmm. then these, they they get pulled out and they become memes on on the internet and poster form. And they they get remediated. So that's that's another way that we experience it. and I guess some of the Seinfeld material, though I, I haven't seen Seinfeld in memes flying across the internet. Uh, oh, it is. Is it? Oh yes, very, very much so. Just go look at it, and you will find a lot. Okay, I promise you. It just doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't seem to come across my my feeds uh, naturally. So I just figured that that uh, I, it wasn't, you know. Uh, dominant in the internet the way let's say game of thrones perhaps is but uh, i mean that's probably true just because it's not new but um but all i need to do is click on a few of them and then they'll start showing up that's what that's the way it works right Yep, yep. Well, the the other thing that i wanted to ask we only have about three minutes left i wanted to talk about uh how uh, profitable Seinfeld has been in in reruns. It it may be more popular in reruns than it was when it was on. Uh, for instance, well, another thing I wanted to point out. I'm trying to cram too much in here once, but you're talking yep. about you're talking about people, uh, you know, either liking Seinfeld or not. I find that true. That uh, I like Seinfeld, and my wife says he's too whiny, you know, the people on their own whiny, you know, but I think it's a bit of an acquired taste. If you give it, you sit through four or five episodes, I think you'll, you'll get into, uh, uh, you know, their style and like it. But anyway, back to uh, the uh, reruns and syndication. Uh, Tell us about that. Yeah, it's been incredibly popular in syndication. I believe it's the most profitable, you know, unless something else has come along and, and, you know, changed that very recently, but I'm pretty sure it's the most profitable in, in reruns. It, you know, most places in America, you can see it on a couple of different channels several mm. times a day. Yes. Um, it's just sort of background noise for us, like in a good way now, you know, mm. it's like, it's like people just turn it on and like, let it go and we'll watch it out. I do it too. I'll watch it if I, if I come across it at any time. So it's been just, it's, there's just something about it that allows people to repeat view and like note you know notice new things about it or just kind of enjoy their favorite lines again Mm -hmm. um i i've talked to a lot of people who said you know this is i watch the two episodes on tbs every night you Mm -hmm. know religiously and that's it so it's just the way i am um so if people really do like to kind of return to the altar of seinfeld to worship over and over again it's it's very (laughs) sort of soothing for for a lot of people and has has contributed to that bottom line a lot. And like any great art form, when you revisit it, you'll see things you didn't see the first time or the second time or the third time. You'll see nuances that you missed, and that's fun. Exactly. And and the way the, the plot lines fit together, too, so strangely, I think that, that allows, like, many times you go like, wait, was that the one with the dentist, too, or whatever? <laughs> and when uh. you watch it again, you're like, oh, that is the one with the dentist, or no, I really thought those two were together. So... They're intricate enough that I think they they allow for that repeat viewing as well. Um, yeah, it, it's 
a real phenomenon that continues. And I didn't realize until I read your book that that was Cranston as the dentist. I'd forgotten that. Yes. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a so wonderful, good. wonderful cameo appearances of so many people. But uh, unfortunately, yada yada yada, I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but thanks so much for joining us today. We've been talking to Jennifer Armstrong about her new book Seinfeldia, which is superb. How a show about nothing changed everything, and it did. You'll want to pick this up. You'll want to read it. Thanks so much for joining us today. I've been your host, Dr. W.F. Strong, signing off for Good Books Radio, and here's hoping that all your books are good reads.